from NASA's IVMV program. I'm going to talk about testing the hardware software interfaces in the ASBELT system using simulated software on emulated hard or real software on emulated hardware, excuse me. Uh, so I'm going to talk briefly about NASA's IVMV program because I have three other colleagues here at the workshop who will be presenting tomorrow. So I just give the facility one introduction. I'll talk about my team. Talk a little bit about our simulation architecture, which we use on a couple of NASA projects. Give an overview of <coughs> excuse me, how hardware is used in NASA projects. And then I'm going to talk about a simulator that we're developing where we found three issues with the flight software's use of hardware. And then I'll conclude. Uh, IVMV grew out of the Challenger accident in 1986. IVMV was first implemented on the space shuttle program at NASA. But NASA wanted to further expand IVMV. Um, I'm not going to read all that, but essentially, uh, the NASA IVMV facility primarily focuses on software and architecture. Uh, it was originally, from my understanding, I, I wasn't there from the beginning, but it was originally a software focused office, but over the last several years, we've grown into also an architectural systems engineering type of role uh, as well. Um, one of the primary things that I do want to stress is that. Uh, bottom point there, when we do our conflict of interest training or OCI mitigation, they talk about how, you know, you want to be sure that there's no, when you, when you take on a project, you don't want to work for a company that has a financial stake in the success of that project if you're doing IVMV on it, right? That would be definite conflict of interest. <coughs> the independent test capability team was chartered to acquire, develop, and maintain test environments for NASA's IVMV program to enable dynamic analysis of software behaviors for multiple missions. Traditionally, IVNV's approach on most projects is static, a lot of static code analysis, a lot of manual inspection. Um, there are a couple of projects which traditionally have had simulators. A lot of those are either heavily instrumented code or software that's compiled on systems that are not their native execution environment. The IDC team provides tools for IVMV analysts to perform independent testing. We develop simulators, we acquire and support hardware for IVMV, we, we run a lab at the facility, and we also acquire and integrate existing simulations. Sometimes in order to meet the customer's needs, we do a combination of all three of those. Uh, dynamic versus static. Static code analysis syntactically verifies code. I'm sure a lot of you have used a static code analysis tool at one point or another. They're great for pointing out that you didn't use a per parameter to a function, or maybe it could detect a buffer overrun with some particular function call, a parameter passed that can detect that you know, a, a buffer overrun might occur. And that's very valuable information. There's no question about that. However, um, with the exception of uh, certain tools which you can provide some rules for a dynamic look, or rather a behavioral look at the software, static code analysis does not really assess behaviors, which is what I mean by a dynamic analysis being able to semantically verify code. It can actually look at the behavior of the, the code as it runs. And then I say you discover issues at runtime. Uh, another point is dynamic analysis yields far fewer false positives in static analysis. I've done static code analysis, I've, I've run tools, and I've had 10,000 results, and only three of them are worth mentioning, but I have to look at all of them. And that's not particularly fun. The nice thing about dynamic analysis is that A, when stuff breaks, it is fun, and B, stuff usually doesn't break that isn't really broken, so you don't have to go through a bunch of results that are meaningless, assuming, of course, that your environment is correct. Um, it is our opinion that the approaches complement each other. We would not advocate replacing one with the other, or vice versa. Um, so I'm going to briefly talk about, and I think there's a laser pointer on this. Uh, ah, yeah, I'm going to briefly talk about the ITZ simulation architecture. Uh, we should have maybe done two presentations, one talking about our sims and our architecture, and then this one. So we didn't do that. I'm going to just briefly go over it. Essentially, we are, and I want to stress this, we are running the actual flight binary provided by the developer. These are the binaries that actually are tested in their hardware labs and that are supposed to, assuming everything's good, fly. So we have what we call a system emulator. It has a processor. In the case of most of our projects, it's a RAD 750. Uh, we're looking into some Leon uh, boards right now. We're also, we've also used a PowerPC 401 uh, model as well. 
So the, the processor model there is, is really an instruction set simulator as well as the hardware on the actual board, you know, an em emulation of that hardware. So things like uh, timers and the interrupt controller, uh, the PCI arbiter, uh, or excuse me, host bridge, uh, things like that. Uh, what we mean by CPCI board is, you know, most, most projects have some type of a back plane, Compact PCI, VME, et cetera. Um, those, a, lot of the, a lot of times those boards are specific to the project. And so we model those boards, and that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, we have a middleware we call ITCSB, uh, ITC Synchronous Bus Middleware. That is where everything talks to each other through. So for example, if we have a compact PCI board that has a 1553 uh, chip on it, the 1553 traffic will go out over the middleware, and RTs, or perhaps the BC, if the simulation is the RT, as it is in some projects, uh, but, but let's say that the BC is, is this guy, and maybe this guy here is an RT. He'll get that traffic <coughs> over the middleware in a format that makes sense for 1553. And with this middleware, you can inject fault and perform testing dynamically without having to modify the environment or the software at all. So we can actually run the actual software on emulated hardware and dynamically inject faults, like say a bit, tr uh, a bit flips on a 1553 RT to BC transfer or, or something along those lines. Um, we also take, a lot of times the projects will have environmental simulators, like uh, for example, um, you might have uh, something like GDS, Goddard Dynamic Simulator, which is a Goddard developed product and, and on certain projects they have models for things like star trackers and even GPS data and they can uh, provide that through SpaceWire 1553, we, we get that information out of the simulator and put it right into the software through our, our hardware models. Um, hardware software interaction. As you know, flight software access is hardware. Someone's got to do it. It might as well be the flight software. And it typically uses memory mapped registers to do that, at least for what we've seen. Um, we, we don't fly a lot of x86 boards, from my experience, with, with I.O. operations. So, you know, we get memory mapped stuff. Registers could be mapped onto external boards like uh, Compact PCI, VME. Um, and typically accesses are one, two, or four bytes in size. Hardware, ac hardware accesses can also be discrete lines, for example, compact PCI discretes or GPIO lines on your particular processor. <coughs> All this is documented in the ICD, the Interface Control Document, uh, Hardware Software Interface Control Document. Access to hardware are defined in these. The ICDs define the memory map, so you get a nice table showing you, you know, here's the offsets of some registers. It describes those registers, so these are what the bits do, this is maybe what certain fields, you know, combination of bits do in those registers. And they, they define not only the offsets and the addresses and what bits are what, but they define the behaviors of those things. Uh, we like to think of it as a hardware user manual for software. Maybe some of you have had that thought as well. The ICD informs a software engineer of the right way and sometimes the wrong way to do things. Uh, actually, I wanted to go back and just in terms of the wrong way to do things, you could have, for example, it, just real quick, it might say, you know, if you want to do these three things, do them, but not until something's done, right? So that's a, a, an important thing um, to remember for a couple slides later. So the IGC team, as I said, provides an executable environment for software binaries. The emulated hardware is written as software. So, you know, we actually will, you know, depending on what type of execution environment we're using, we might look at an ICD and you know, we'll, we'll create the registers and we'll create the bits and the fields and we'll define behaviors and, and that just you know, is, is writing software. I'm, you, some of you may have used Kimu, for example, and you can you know, add a register to your address space and you can, when that's written, perform some function. You know, it'll call your function and you can you know, do, do uh, whatever you need with it. So um, we typically don't write instruction set simulators. We've been very fortunate the processors that the software run on, you know, they're already existing instruction set simulators, but there is no existing model for the NASA specific hardware, so my team models that. We recreate this hardware, we model this hardware from the ICDs, usually explicitly, but sometimes, you know, the ICDs maybe, depending on the project, aren't in the best shape, and so you don't have all the information, and that, that's another presentation. Um, and then the behavior is modeled from the description in those ICDs, as well as, like I said before, the, the memory mapped I.O., the registers, the bits, the fields, et cetera. 
When you model this hardware, it can be very tempting. Some people, especially when they model things from a development standpoint and not an IV and V standpoint, will say things like, model the minimal behavior required to achieve functionality for your software under test instead of trying to you know, do all the bit flipping and, excuse, and everything that, that has to happen. And, and I agree, you don't want to do bit flipping of say a serial line. If there's a byte in your TX FIFO, you send it. You don't bit flip. But that doesn't mean that if the ICD says that some particular action needs to be performed first before you set this bit, that the model should just blindly go through with it. Um, so you can, for example, by just taking the behaviors of what to do and what not to do and perform checks, your actual model, for essentially for free, just in the process of executing the software, can make sure that these rules are followed. And that's what we're going to talk about. <coughs> so this is great because at IVNV, uh, the regression testing up here, we get drops. We get code from the developer every so often, and we want to run it on our environment, and we don't have to necessarily run integration tests with their code in our environment because a lot of that, that testing is done by simply the model being aware of, of what it is and what it can and can't do. It also allows us to verify the ICD. We may have software do some, you know, make some action that the model says, hey, this is invalid, you know, something happened out of order, something was the wrong access size, etc. And we can say, well, wait a minute, flight software is doing this, the ICD says something else, which one's wrong, we can go back to the developer and try to figure that out. So the method, when modeling the hardware, behavior should be driven by the ICD. So we don't look at the flight software and say, okay, the flight software is writing a one to this bit with a comment here saying do this. So we're gonna go ahead and make our model do that. That's not what we do, we look, we look at the ICD. Uh, you know, it's sort of like the, the old thing about uh, you wanna design your software and then write code instead of write code, then write your design. Similar, similar type of philosophy. Um, preconditions for some operation as defined in the ICD should be checked by the model. So I keep, I keep going back to this example of the model. The ICD says some particular operation should be done before you set the go bit. So the model should check that. We log any undefined behavioral states as defined by the ICD. Um, that's important because how many times have we seen an ICD that says if you do some particular thing, it will result in undefined behavior. Well, if we're modeling hardware, we can't really create undefined behavior because typically when you're writing software, undefined behavior is a bug. So we don't want to create bugs and we can't necessarily. So all we can do is, is keep the, the, the model in as good of a state as we can and log the fact that undefined behavior occurred. Uh, if the ICD defines behavior outside the level of detail for the simulation, it can be ignored. Um, I mentioned bit flipping. Uh, we don't need to do that necessarily. If we know that the serial port is gonna transfer a byte from the FIFO and it's going to take one millisecond, we can just go ahead and send that byte and not trigger the next byte send for one millisecond in simulated time. Uh, if the behavior affects pre or post conditions, it must be minimally implemented to perform those checks, however. So there might be a rule that says we're gonna send one byte every millisecond you're not allowed to put a new byte in until a millisecond has passed. So even though we aren't actually modeling that time, we will keep a flag in sim time that, that so we can say, flight software tried to write a byte, you know, 0.6 milliseconds into the previous byte transfer, which would violate the ICD. Not all timing requirements need to be modeled. Oh, I just said that essentially, so I won't read that. I just gave that an example for that, excuse me. Benefits of this approach. We can detect correct or incorrect use of hardware as described in the ICD. Undefined behavioral states, as I mentioned, are, are detected. We get regression testing for free, and we say for free because we have to run it anyway, so if the model is self-checking, it will tell us, hey, this new version violates some rule. We can compare that to old results, or we can just, with a couple of clicks, load a previous version and compare results as well. Uh, so some examples of these types of problems that we find uh, use a bank of memory unless a problem is detected. So maybe the software uses the wrong bank. Uh, I keep using this example. Do not access and register before hardware indicates completion of some operation. Only write certain bit patterns in a field. Maybe uh, there's a five bit field. Only certain patterns are defined. So ultimately we want to verify that flight software follows the rules laid out in the ICD correctly and we feel that this approach does that. So we're gonna talk briefly about a case study. 
Uh, we're developing a project simulator. It's got a Rad 750 CPU with a compact PCI backplane. There are five boards, uh, three of board C and a board A and a board B. The core of this work is modeling the three types of boards. This is not our first project. Our architecture is already laid out. Our processes are in place and we don't have to you know, go back and reinvent the wheel. We've already got a lot of this stuff going, our 1553, our space wire, uh, space wire routers for, for Goddard, the Goddard router. We've got um, all this stuff. It's reusable architecture. We can simply proceed. And in fact, for this particular project, our first prototype took about two months. And the first project we did took about six to eight months, somewhere in there to have. So we've really cut down on the time. Uh, boards are created entirely from the several ICDs that come with them. So you may have a board level ICD, the board may have three FPGAs, and there's three ICDs for you know, the, the three FPGAs, et cetera. Uh, during the course of this development, three major issues were discovered with the flight software. Probably really only two of them are major. One of them is just another issue, but we, we didn't want to get too verbose here. Um, so I'm going to talk about those briefly, and then that will wrap up the presentation. The ICD describes interface, uh, an interface to a Summit 1553 chip, which is on one of the boards. Uh, 1553, as many of you, probably all of you know, is a structured communication bus commonly used in aerospace. The bus consists of a single bus controller and several remote terminals. Uh, the Summit 1553 chip is a very commonly used part. It has several 16-bit registers which go with the control of that chip. It uses an external SRAM module. Well, there are some versions with built-in memory. This particular one uses uh, the external module. Um, so the first issue we're going to talk about is an issue clearing legalization registers on the Summit 1553 chip. Um, if we look up here, uh, there, there's two 1553 chips with the 16-bit registers, as I mentioned. On this board, they access those registers with 32-bit access, accesses. So one access will really access two 16-bit registers, so you wind up actually reading and writing two at a time, even though the software sees one access. So the code, of course, is written with this um, hardware setup in mind. Uh, so this here is essentially defined in, in the uh, ICD, um, and then we have some code here. There's a little, little snippet of code, and um, you can see the comment, clear all 16 16-bit illegalization registers with 832-bit rights. And we see this loop here, eight times illegalization. Uh, there's, I'll show this structure on the next page, um, I times two. So essentially uh, what we're doing here is this is set up to write every other illegalization register because, at least as the software was written, they're 32-bit accesses. However, oh, wrong page. The however is on the next slide. This is, this is uh, from the ICD. This is the, the map for that summit chip. So as you can see here, 32, bit, 32 bits gives you two registers on the summit part. We're interested in these illegalization registers down here. This is the however. You can see that these, this is a C representation of those registers and this, you know, they take one of these structures, you know, typecast it to, or typecast a memory location to a, a pointer of this type and they can access these things. You can see that despite what the ICD says, the illegalization registers are defined as unsigned shorts, not, not longs. Um, so that is a bug because that's a two byte, not a four byte. That code I showed you is now doing two byte writes instead of four byte writes, which is what the ICD says you have to do. The programmer's own comment indicates that there's eight four byte accesses, but in reality there's eight two byte accesses that skip every odd numbered register because of that incorrect declaration. The actual hardware will accept the two byte access on a power PC. Uh, the hardware model will not. It threw an error and halted. What was mapped into that memory space was expecting a four byte access, software did a two byte access, and the way we had it set up, it logged the incorrect access size and it stopped. So in order to continue our simulation work, we had to either patch the flight uh, binary itself, which we don't want to do because that goes against our rules of do not modify the software, run the binary. So instead we, we sort of patched our models because of the way that our execution environment deals with memory maps. We mapped in something else that would do the translation for us and we'll remove that when the appropriate version of flight software is delivered with that fix. Briefly, illegalization registers allow some 1553 traffic to be ignored. On power on, those registers are set to zero per the <coughs> summit spec. 
flight software does not correctly or does not currently change them. In fact, the ICD even says for this project they're not to be used. However, there could be some kind of a power glitch that jumbles those. There could be an SCU, or you could even access those registers via a memory load from ground. And then if you do a processor reset, they won't be cleared. So you're going to have some of your 1553 traffic disabled. Uh, second issue, these aren't quite as long. Uh, Spacewire is an ESA specification implemented in many NASA projects. Uh, Spacewire uses routers to send messages to where they need to go. The sender must know where to send messages. It must be aware of the topology of the Spacewire network. Many of you probably already know this. Our project has a board with, with a Spacewire router and a fault injection register. An invalid value is written to the register. That's what we're going to talk about. Uh, in the ICD, there's some registers on this board. One of them is a Spacewire link configuration register. There's also a built-in test register, which this particular instruction here accesses. With, and it, send, it writes this value to it. The built-in test register is not defined in the ICD for this board. That's one issue. Um, so up here, what, what this code does is it sets the addresses of these things on, of these registers on the board in constant memory. And so they are setting the built-in test register address to some constants. But then a few lines down, they set the same thing to another address. Well, this is the correct address. This is not. What they've actually done is they've set this built-in test register address to the spacewire link configuration register. So when the code down here writes this board C lights off pattern, what it's actually doing, this is a piece of the ICD for that spacewire link configuration register, and it's actually writing 111 to this field, which is an undefined value. So what happened when, this, when we ran this, the hardware model had two errors logged. One, one, the first error was a bit was written to a reserved field, which the ICD says should all be zero. And so some of the stuff under this black shroud here are reserved. It's not particularly secret. They don't do anything they reserve. Uh, writing an unknown pattern to a defined field, however, is a more serious issue. So when that write occurs, the spacewire link configuration register is doing, don't know. It could trigger the fault injection hardware. Maybe it doesn't, but all of a sudden, this thing, the behavior is now undefined because of that issue. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, the last issue, the Summit 1553 chip used on, on this one of those boards is the type that uses an external memory module. The project uses a module twice the required size, when they, they, they call that two separate banks. So there's a, an arbiter that the flight software can access that SRAM, the 1553 chip can access that SRAM, only one can access at a time, and um, the, 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 the FPGA that does this arbitration will do the bank switching based on how it's configured. Uh, the software is written to use the wrong bank. So this bold part here, uh, the bank select bits, both initialized to zero, should never be changed to one unless there's been some kind of an SRAM problem. Well, we're writing a simulator. How can we possibly have an SRAM problem on a simulator? There's no EDAC on this thing. There's really no actual way for the hardware to know there's a problem. So this would have to be something that ground would figure out and try the second bank on this particular project. Um, that being said, this constant, use upper bank, this code here does the reset. We can see that the code for this one particular summit chip is actually hard-coded in to use the upper bank. Not a real serious problem, but it does violate the ICD. So because the ICD said that only bank zero should be used when the model was created, we said, well, if they set it to one, because there can't possibly be a problem in a sim, as I said, we'll go ahead and flag that as an event that occurred. So we were able to find this issue just by, again, executing the software. So in conclusion, analysis of implemented software should include its use of hardware. And this is something that um, some IV and V projects at NASA's IV and V program have looked at, others not so much. If functionality is correct, and unless hardware is implemented with certain tricks, the developers may never realize these violations are occurring. The, the, the two-byte access instead of four-byte, they're not going to know that unless the FPGA is wired up with the T-size bits, on the, the TSIZ bits on the PowerPC architecture, telling it what the size is, and then if the size is wrong, the FPGA could like turn on an LED or it could output a stroke, whatever it wants to do. <coughs> unless they do that, they won't know that that's happening, for example. Um, Software-only simulators provide mechanisms to support vigorous IV and V activities. Again, we feel that there's a benefit to, to, to NASA's facility for this. Um, and then building software-only simulators with sufficient levels of detail so that ICD errors like these can be found for free 
is generally a good idea and deviates from the typical uh, development simulation model of minimal use case to get it working. Uh, so one other thing I wanted to mention, because I've got four seconds left, is our simulators are a full-blown replacement for COTS labs. We have developers at Goddard using our stuff on one laptop. One laptop replaces for a flight software developer or a test engineer millions of dollars worth of hardware in, in a lab. And we think that that's definitely value added to NASA. Uh, if anybody wants to see a demo of one of our simulators, you can come talk to us. We've got them on our laptops and we'd be happy to, to share. Well, at least Scott has it on his laptop. We've all been updating to 64-bit and not all of us are done. So uh, anyway, any questions? No questions? Well, all right. So, so for the example project you were talking about, uh -huh. when did you do that analysis compared to when the software was actually done? That analysis was actually done while, again, for free, because that all happened while developing the board models. So essentially, um, I start going, that, that particular project, unlike many others, is very nice in that it detects that the board is inserted, and it only uses the board if it is inserted, which means that I could pick one board and start my work, model the board, run the software, then I could unplug the board and do work on the next one. So in the process of doing this and just testing my own interfaces my, my, and my hardware modeling, I was able to start seeing these errors get flagged. So this really was a pre-process uh, or, or very early in the simulation development phase. This, this, the IVMV team hasn't actually used this particular simulator yet because it's not quite done. We, we finished the, the first, um, what they call level of detail, I guess you could say, and now we're working on the second level. Um, and they're not interested in the current, you know, low level of detail version. Uh, anyone else? All right. How, how available are your simulators? I mean, can people use them that aren't in your group, or is this the expertise needed? Oh, oh no, absolutely. Um, once we deploy them, they're they're ready to go. We have, like I said, uh, we're NASA's IVMV facility is in West Virginia, and you know, Goddard's in Maryland, and we have people at Goddard using our stuff, and we don't have to be there. Um, <coughs> the only issue really becomes if, we, uh, if one of our simulators is using a commercial tool, um, they may have to get a license, but otherwise, you know, there's no holdups. Anyone can run it. within the NASA dealer if you're working on a NASA project, like for instance, could Southwest use one of your simulators, or is that a question? Oh, actually, um, very, oh, I'm so glad you asked, I can plug. Uh, <laughs> <coughs> our simulation architecture, which is highly reusable, and as I said, allowed us to, to bring up these later simulations very quickly compared to the first when we were developing all this stuff. Um, the core of that architecture is currently being uh, put through the process of patenting and possibly being licensable for commercial use, and it probably would be free for something like Southwest. Um, so we're very much interested. We were orig originally going to open source it, actually. Uh, but we, they were told that there might be licensing potential. So we want, we would absolutely love, and, and all this stuff is developed as APIs with the developer in mind for leveraging on your own sims. So we have the whole, like part of this, for example, is 1553 and Spacewire. If you're developing a sim that uses Spacewire, um, the only thing that you might have to do to use our stuff and, and talk to any existing Spacewire solution that you might have is the router model, if it's not done, whatever is needed to tie that. So that we have, you might have to model the FPGA that does space wire and then tie it to our interface that goes to our middleware. And then we took, um, one of the gentlemen sitting back there actually took uh, a 1553 base simulator, an RT, and the same rules apply for a space wire sim. He, he took a 1553 simulator that works with a real card, a real 1553 card, replaced the DLL that the software uses and made it talk to our, our virtual bus without recompiling the software or anything. So you can tailor any existing solution to this virtual bus and have all these things tied together. Um, and we would, we would uh, really love getting that out there and hopefully someday we will. So thank you for asking that. Uh, no. <laughs> but we could. Do people still, u do people still use those? No. <laughs> okay. Well, so to try to get caught up. We're a little bit behind schedule right now. Thank you, Stephen, very much. Thank you.